Hello, everybody. This is Lowell Thomas. Somebody has asked me, just what is this American way that we talk of defending today? And what's ahead for us Americans? Well, I'm going to answer those questions by telling a chapter of the story of America, the story of how we have created a land of opportunity here. Now, precisely, what is this American way? Democracy? Free enterprise? Our civil rights? Freedom of the press and worship? Yes, of course. It was the toil and sweat of men and women that built this great country of ours. And today, with the united purpose to build a strong and progressive and free nation, American men and women are still doing their share, whether it be a mechanic at his lathe, or a laborer, or the women in the office, or the farmer, yes, and the doctor, the investment banker, and the women in the home, and millions of other Americans too, men and women who work hard, who save a few dollars, or many dollars, and send them out looking for a profitable job to do to help build the nation. Industries are created by the coming together of men, private savings, and productive ideas. This combination develops new inventions by the thousands and spreads our commerce and thereby gives more and more people employment and greater purchasing power. That is the way it has always been in this country, for that is the pattern of the American system. To see how this pattern works, we would only have to go back a few generations to any street in any American town. Good evening, David. Good evening, Mr. Hawley. Nice evening, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Don't let that oil drip on you. No, no, I'll be careful. All right. Good night, Mr. Hawley. Oh, hello, John. Come in. I haven't seen you for quite some time. Well, I've been pretty busy in the shop. Well, uh, sit down. I'll be with you in just a minute. Total these drafts and bring them back. Yes, sir. Well? It's a nice piece of work, Mr. McPhail. Well, it should be. Cost me enough when your father made it. Well, you know, well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. What, about my desk? Oh, no, sir. But about the shop. You see, I've been running it all by myself. I'm doing pretty good, too. Matter of fact, more business than I can handle. Well, you're very fortunate, young man. I don't know about that. If I could enlarge the shop, I could do a lot more business. Of course, that'll take money and... I see. And uh, you're leading up to a loan? Well, in a way, sir. But I wasn't exactly thinking in terms of a loan. I thought maybe you might come into the business with me as a partner. You put up the money, I'll do the work and supply the management. And what am I to get out of all this if I become your money partner? Well, you... And I said, if. Well, you'll be making a profit on your investment, of course. And what is more, we'll be making jobs for workers. Our town will grow. And when we get started, we can buy materials in quantities and get them cheaper. Why, everybody will benefit. But I have to have the money to start with. Yes. <clears throat> uh, yes, of course. Good night, Mr. McPhail. And that's the way American industries have started and grown and produced better things. Today, of course, we're a big country. We do things on a big scale. So big, we can't depend upon one man or a small group of men to finance them. Modern industry is financed by the individual savings of a great many people. And their savings and men with ideas are brought together by an investment banker. That's how plants with fusion...
That's how they come to be owned by thousands of persons who invested their savings. That is the American way. Take almost any of our resources. Before you and I could enjoy them, there had to be someone with an idea of how to use them. And then there had to be dollars to develop them. Once, iron ore was only rocks and dust to Minnesota and Michigan, a great natural resource that was useless until men with ideas and men with money were brought together to build railroads to move the ore to the furnaces of Pittsburgh and Chicago and Wheeling, where other men and ideas and money had been brought together to convert it into all kinds of full commodities, from structural steel skyscrapers and bridges to surgical instruments, from ships and tractors to cooking utensils and even needles and pins. And there was the great resource we call invention, the vast storehouse of ideas in the minds of enterprising Americans, ideas for improving the old ways of doing things, ideas for new machines, new services, inventions that could, when the man with the idea found the men with the money, develop new industries and create jobs for millions and add new comforts and conveniences to the daily lives of Americans. In this collection of patent models, are the forerunners of many of our modern conveniences. Would you believe it? That's the typewriter that John Jones patented in 1852. That was the grandfather of your refrigerator. And how would you like to defend your country with a machine gun like that? Imagine they churned butter with that in 1877. And there's a washing machine and the original tin type. With that as a start, photography has progressed to the motion pictures you are now seeing. And today, we still go forward to the extent that invested savings flow into new enterprise. It's the coming together of materials and ideas and people that builds the future. Of people from Albuquerque, from Atlanta, and from the sidewalks of New York. They put their savings together to back an industrial idea or build a new city hall and make jobs for stonemasons and carpenters. Put their savings together to build a paper mill in the south and make jobs for steel workers and electricians. And just so, they built a railroad through the Rockies or a schoolhouse in Ohio. Once the blacksmith had only simple tools costing a few dollars, but now every steel worker uses $10,000 worth of tools and equipment and back of each average manufacturing worker is $5,000. By following that pattern, we have become the most fortunate people on Earth. And yet some say, times have changed. Our opportunities have gone. Our frontiers have vanished. Opportunities gone in a country as rich in resources as this. Frontiers vanished. Geographical frontiers, perhaps. But today, we face new frontiers, gaze toward new horizons. Those frontiers are in research laboratories and in American ingenuity and resourcefulness. Ingenuity that finds use for surplus cotton by converting it into picture film. Ingenuity that fashions garments from glass and stockings from coal and synthetic rubber from oil. Today, we cross a continent in a few hours. A century ago, it took long, weary months. For it was not by chance that ideas, energy, work, and dollars came together to make progress, to open a mine or develop a telephone. There is a know-how behind it all. Behind the story of steel, there is the know-how of the iron puddler. And behind the automobile, there is the know-how of the mechanic. And just as a fine stand of wheat is the result of the know-how of the farmer, Behind the flow of capital, there is the know-how of the investment banker. But I am going to let an expert in the field of economics tell you about it. This is Dr. Neil Carruthers, Dean of the School of Business Administration of Lehigh University. Thank you, Law. What I shall try to do is to show just how private saving and investing by courageous and far-sighted people build and maintain our American civilization. The outstanding fact is that investment capital, the accumulated stored up savings, is the motor force of our entire 
industrial system. This is not always obvious at first glance. When we look at a giant automobile plant or a great oil refinery, we do not always realize that our system grew slowly and steadily and only because thousands of people saved and invested. Let's look at the actual mechanics of our economic system. The productivity of our American industry pours out a vast stream of national income. This income is divided among workers, lenders, and owners. This diagram gives you a simple illustration. Here is a vast stream of the nation's income, amounting in normal times to perhaps $75 billion. The bulk of this stream of income necessarily and properly goes to consumption. It provides all the necessities and luxuries of the whole people. But a part of the national income must go into savings. Industrial supplies and equipment are constantly being used up. New and better materials and methods are constantly discovered. A steady flow of capital investment into industry is essential to the maintenance, the improvement, and the expansion of national production. Industrial enterprise must have new capital for improvement and for the plant expansions that make jobs and build communities. In these days of strange economic theories, you sometimes hear saving condemned. That idea is dangerously wrong. If all the stream of income should go into consumption, our industrial progress would end. There would be none left for expansion. Stop that flow of savings and investment, and our standard of living would decline. The ways in which investment capital finds employment in industry are among the most interesting of all economic processes. It is the investment banker who makes it possible for savers anywhere in the United States to find an outlet for their funds wherever an opportunity exists. He does this by cooperating in the creation of investment security, making investigations which investors cannot make for themselves, making the first wholesale purchase with his own capital, like any other merchant, and taking the risk of finding retail buyers. Through him, the savings of the American people are funneled into productive enterprise. It is the investor who decides finally where his savings shall go. No investment banker can finance an industry unless investors approve the undertaking. And always the investment banker attempts to help the investor make a wise choice to protect him from unsound investment. Somewhere in the past, the investment banker brought to the investor securities of the infant electric light industry of the early automobile companies, of the first railroads. That was how great American industries were born. That is how that schoolhouse in Ohio, that paper mill in the South, and that railroad across the continent came to be built. That is how John Hawley's furniture business could grow and expand. That is the American way. When the natural flow of savings from the investor to the industries and public services of America is free and unobstructed, this American way brings untold benefits. It brought to Americans the greatest civilization ever known. To play his part in this pattern of progress, the investment banker applies his knowledge. Of course, before we undertake to finance this new plant of yours, we must make a full study. As you know, not only does the law prescribe certain procedures, but sound business judgment makes it essential that we have full information about your business before we can ask the public to invest. Of course. Now, uh, even with an established business such as yours, we must make a thorough investigation. We must check your audited figures. 
we have to make an engineering survey and have your titles, patents, processes, and methods examined. I understand. If everything proves out, then we are ready to buy your securities for resale to our investor customers. Naturally, both of us have a responsibility to the public, and we cannot take anything for granted where their savings are concerned. When investment bankers sell securities, of a manufacturer, say, those stocks and bonds go into many hands. The private investor buys some. Every person who saves, whether through life insurance or through a savings account, is indirectly a purchaser of security. Because that is a way the life insurance official or the banker puts to work the dollars that have been left with him. Money must work. It can't be productive lying idle in bulk. A heavy responsibility rests on the investment banker. His decisions must be based on all known facts. The tools of his trade are an intimate knowledge of industry, an experienced perception of business risk and municipal credit as well as a broad understanding of economic trends. He is an essential instrument in our economic system. For 10 years, we have suffered a grievous depression. One of the major causes of the long delay in recovery was the stagnation of investment capital. The life-giving stream which normally flows into enterprise has been only a thin trickle in order that our American way of life shall continue. We must be able to see ahead to a renewed stream of investment. The saver, the investment banker, and the producer must be teamed up again. Listen to this, Ruth. During the period from 1920 to 1930 inclusive, the average annual sum of $3,500,000,000 billion flowed from investors through investment bankers to American industry. Since 1930, there has only been $700 million, or one-fifth as much annually. This flow of capital so necessary to jobs and security must be re-stimulated. As mayor of our city, I shall seek $1 million for new school buildings. Of course, we expect to pay for the use of the money. We will issue bonds. It has been invested savings seeking a legitimate return that has financed the growth of America. Private investment capital keeps business growing, provides public services, and keeps men at work. I'm just the average worker, but it takes a lot of money to finance my job and buy the tools and machinery I work with. There's no getting around that. My company needs five million dollars for plant expansion. To meet defense needs, the nation is calling for more production. To meet that demand, we must expand. These are the voices of Americans who want to work things out the American way. Everywhere, everyone wants the American dollar to find work to do so that it can join men with ideas and under free institutions build a strong and virile industrial system. Our American way has proved itself in the merging of men, ideas, and savings to build a great nation. We're going to defend it. We're going to make it better. For that is the American way. It is the way forward for free men and free women.
You know, sometimes we pharmacists forget that we're human beings. With our long hours, we ignore the relaxation and fun that most men take for granted. We don't even realize how much we neglect our own families. And it's a funny thing, we forget there's another world, a world outside our stores, and that it's constantly changing. It even changes the lives and habits of our own customers. But you know, this is so gradual that we don't even see it. That's what happened to me. I got so closed up in the walls of my daily routine that it took something pretty basic to make me open my eyes, to make me see that I had to change my store and the way I live in it. That's why I want to tell you my story. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I don't know what face picked Mrs. Morrison to start this day for me, but she certainly did a good job. She started knocking the day cockeyed right smack in the middle of the morning. I'm sorry, ma'am. Hello, Mrs. Morris. Hello, Mary. Is Mr. Higgins here? Oh, yes. Uh, may I see him, please, right away? Certainly, I'll get him for you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Higgins. He'll be with you in just a moment. Thank you, Mary. Well, what's wrong, Mrs. Morrison? In a hurry, Charlie, in a terrible hurry. Is somebody sick? Oh, goodness, no. I've just decided to make my bedroom drapes a different color. Uh, want to get some dye before I change my mind. Uh, surely, what color would you like? Well, I don't know. Uh, have you got a chart or something I could look at? A chart? Yes, we have a color chart. Uh... Dad. Hi, Dave. I'll have the chart in just a second, Mrs. Morrison. Hello, Mrs. Morris. Hello, Dave. I'd like a package of Gillette Blue Blades, please. Huh? Oh, uh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, Mary over there, she'll take care of you. Thanks. Oh, Charlie, uh, what about the chart? Oh, yes, the chart. Oh, I must have Ted straighten out this mess sometime. Here you are, sir. Will that be all? Yes, I guess so. Don't see anything else. Just the blades. Just the blades? Will that be all? What's the matter with Mary? Why doesn't she suggest the large size? Or shaving cream? Or lotion? Any luck, Charlie? Uh, oh, uh, just a minute, just a minute. I'll have it for you in just a minute now. There. There's your color chart. Thank you. What's the matter with you? Can't what? you be happy with the store just once? What do you want? Now, don't get sore till I ask you to lend me the five bucks to take Janie to lunch. <laughs> All right. Here. Have fun. Thanks, Dad. Maybe I can see you tonight. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, Charlie. Oh, yes. Charlie. My drapes are green now. If I get yellow, will I have to use color remover first? Well, uh, doesn't it say on the chart? I don't know. Can't read without my glasses. And so the morning went. And for some reason, everything seemed to annoy me more than usual. Do you have kale pectate? The doctor said... Some double mint gum, please. And would you mind wrapping all these packages so I... But you don't want to miss out on a bonus good deal, do you, Mr. Higgins? Well, you make up prescriptions. Why don't you carry that brand? It's advertised everywhere. All the stores have it. Look, if you buy three more dozen, you get this display free. And in the afternoon, things didn't get any better. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was, uh, oh, seven months ago. Maybe it was long in the spring, in March or April. It was in a small bottle, and I think it was pink. 
Yes, that's right. I remember. It was a pink liquid in a small bottle. That's what it was. Well, I don't understand why you can't find it. I remember perfectly. It was positively pink. Uh, excuse me, just a minute. Uh, maybe Mr. Roberts will remember. Oh. Uh, Bert, come here. Uh, there's a customer out there, a Mrs. Jordan. She wants to... Sure, I couldn't help hearing. Pink. A two-month prescription they always remember is kind of white. A four-month prescription is sort of yellow. And anything over six months is always pink. Uh, Oh, I don't know. There's something either wrong with people or with me. The day's only half over and I keep wishing it would end. Oh, cheer up. It usually does. Yeah. Uh, Hello, Mr. Higgins. They told me I'd find you back here. Oh, yes, Tim. I've got the new mats and layouts we talked about. Remember? You said you'd like to start running a different kind of ad in the shopper this week. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I want something more distinctive. Something that says, uh, well, just Higgins Pharmacy. I'm not getting enough out of my advertising. Mr. Higgins, there are a couple of salesmen out here for you. Oh, look, Tim, uh, I'm too busy today. I haven't got time. Uh, oh, hang it, just run the same ad. We'll change it next week. Oh, Mr. Higgins, uh, just put up a small display. Is the spot okay? No, no, I... No, I'd rather have it, uh... Well, just leave it there for now. Okay. See you next time. Sure, sure. And then came that four o'clock fever time. Hmm. What's the matter? Find something new? New? I was just trying to figure out how long that shelf would stay up. It'll be fixed. These things take time. Yeah, everything takes time. And there's time for everything. Yep, yep, yep. Well, well, the high school philosopher. What brings out the wisdom in you? Oh, time. Whenever I have time, I let the wise words fall where they may. And the saying for today is, boy, is this place fouled up. Well, look. Since you've got so much time, you can start to reorganize the basement. There's a case of brick shampoo that hasn't been opened in three days, and we need some up here. Say no more. I'm on my way. I was just loused up by time. And the word for today is reorganize. Ooh. Where are you going, Ted? Uh, bring up some merchandise. No, no, that can wait. There's a couple of prescriptions back there that have to be delivered right away. Well, thanks for the order, Mr. Higgins. Sure. Say, have you had a chance to go over this home study training program? I left it for you last time. It's the one on suggestion selling. Well, I glanced at it, but I haven't had time to really do anything about it. You know, it not only helps your people sell our merchandise, but, well, will mark research figures prove that it's the best way to boost all sales all over the store. Sure, it's... sure, I know, I know. Uh, look, uh, let's talk about it on your next call, hmm? Okay, Mr. Higgins. Yes, ma'am. I want some Breck shampoo for oily hair, please. Certainly. Oh, if I don't do it myself, it never gets done. Mary, why don't we bring up some Breck shampoo for oily hair? The Ted just went down to the basement for some. Well, if you don't have any, I... Oh, certainly we have it. Uh, if you'll just wait, I'll go down and get it myself. No, no, I can't wait. I'm late for an appointment now. It'll only take a minute. No, uh, I'll come back. But, uh... Anything else, ma'am? No, just a bottle of iodine. What's the matter today? Even Bert. Why doesn't he sell cotton, tape, gauze pads? And to cap off the longest day of my life, just before closing time. Gosh, Mr. Higgins. How clumsy can you get? Oh, what a mess. Now, for sure that shelf has to be fixed. 
I thought you'd stay out late tonight. No, why? So you could be with people you like. Well, I like you. Any objections? <laughs> I'll meet you and we walk home together. Spend the last night of my furlough with you and Mom. Fine. Come on. I'll stick around and help you close up. Huh? All right. Thanks, genius. That's a step in the right direction. Huh? Come on. You know, Dad, I, I sometimes wonder which would be easier. To get the Army to reorganize its dispensaries or to get you to do something with this store. Well, for the time being, I'd appreciate it if you'd concentrate on the Army. Sure, sure. All right, all right. Something has to be done, but not tonight, huh, Dave? No arguments, not again, not tonight. All right. But you can't blame me for thinking about the store. You know, after all, you just put my name up on that sign outside. Uh, just leave those things. Bert will arrange it his own way tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> hey, what's this doing here? What? I didn't know any of my baby toys were still around. Oh. <laughs> hey, remember how I used to like this? Used to carry it around all day and then take it to bed with me at night. That's probably because it resembles me, all three of them. I'm afraid I have to agree with you. Well, you better not. Reflects on you. <laughs> but do you keep this here all the time? Why not? Oh, no reason. It's a little sentimental, but I like it. Well, a little sentiment never hurt anybody. Uh, besides, I... Uh... Come on. Let's go home and romance your mother. Okay, then. Oh, sure, Dave, you're right. After you get out of the army, you shouldn't even consider going back on the road. Still, Dad, you can't deny that selling pharmaceuticals was a darn good education. I saw all kinds of stores, neighborhoods. Oh, that's all right, but not for you. You're a pharmacist. You know, Bert is anxious to leave. As soon as you get back, he's found a little store he likes. Molly, can I have some more milk? No. <laughs> huh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your father. He had to put your name up on the sign. Couldn't wait six more months until you were discharged. Sure. I'm excited. Why not? How often does my only son go into business with me? Well, your only son's excited, too. I don't know, I like being a pharmacist. I like filling prescriptions, helping people. I get a big kick out of merchandise. I like watching the world through a number one capsule. <laughs> I'm nuts. <laughs> sure. You're stupid. <laughs> You're both stupid. Gosh, Dad, I can hardly wait to get in that store where I really belong. Dad, I got a million ideas. Together in a couple of years, we can turn this store into the hottest thing in town. No, oh, it's hard enough, Dave. I don't want to set the city on fire. No, it's not a matter of setting anything on fire. It's a matter of keeping up with the times and making the most of what you got. Now, Dad, the location's great. You got customers who like you. Sure. They like me because I'm the same guy I was 20 years ago and in the same store. Oh, sure, there are some things I have to change, but... Uh, I'll get around to them in time. Yeah, that's just it. But, Dad, you can't keep putting it off. Now, look. It's dark. The store's dingy. Reorganized. Departmentalized. It's a lousy store. Now, Dad, I didn't say that. It's not a lousy store. It's a lazy store. Because you're not making use of it. What does he mean? I've got merchandise in every square inch I can find. Sure, but it's confused and disorganized like a bargain basement because you haven't got any plans. Look, Dad, people want to be served fast these days. Even help themselves when they can. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Self-selection, hot spot display. Make the store a visual want book. Words, phrases, assembly line methods. He knows how I feel about all this modern hocus pocus. We're too busy at the store. We haven't time. But Dad. Don't forget, Dave. The store was successful enough to pay your way through college. All right, I know, and I'm grateful. But don't you see, now they're going to be two of us. We just can't keep on running the same store you did 20 years ago. People have changed. They're still people, aren't they? Yes, but they act differently. They think differently. And they buy differently. So, I tell you, my volume is up. Oh, Dad, everybody's volume is up. But look, so are costs and taxes and salaries. Well, I'm still satisfied. But you can't be, Dad. Look, you're standing still, but your competition isn't. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, is it? Well, look around you. Variety stores, supermarkets, other drug stores. 
They're catering to the change in buying habits. They don't bother me. No, not yet, maybe. Now is the time to do something. Otherwise, your competition's gonna chew away at your whole business. They'll even eat into your prescriptions. No. Nothing can hurt my prescription business. Nothing, do you understand? It's the heart of the store. I'm a good pharmacist. Bert's a good pharmacist. My old customers know this. Oh, Dad, you gotta start thinking about more than old customers. Look, they get older. Things happen to them. They move away. You need new customers all the time. Sure, I need new customers. Well, if you don't make the front of the store clean and organized and up to date in a professional way, why should your new customers think your prescription department hidden away in the back is any different? That's ridiculous. Oh, I wish that whole wall section had fallen down at the store. Then you'd have to move your prescription booth out where people could see it. All right. Now that's enough. I, I don't understand you, Dad. You're as deaf, dumb, and blind as those three monkeys on that toy of mine. That's enough, I said. Dad, you're asleep. You refuse to move. You gotta wake up. Stop. Look around. Listen to people. Find out what the other stores are doing, how they're changing. Find out how... You've got your ideas. I don't happen to agree with them. Someday, when the store's all yours, you can do as you want. Now, that's all I'll listen to from you. I didn't want to argue with him, huh? I know. I know. Here, finish your milk. Why didn't you wake me earlier? You were sleeping. Well, I know I was sleeping, but why didn't you call me before Dave left? Here, now, drink your orange juice. Well, I guess he didn't want to say goodbye. Oh, certainly he did. You were asleep when he came up to say goodbye. It was my idea not to wake you. He tossed and turned until 5 o'clock this morning. I thought you needed the rest. Oh. He said he'd write you. Well, look now, what about breakfast? No, it's too late. I don't want any. Oh, Charlie. Well, all right, just the juice. He's a stubborn boy, Davis. He's pig-headed. Certainly he's pig-headed. He takes after you. Oh, so you think I'm wrong, too? No. No, I don't think you're wrong, and I don't really think that Dave's wrong, either. But I want you two to respect each other's ideas, not to fight. But he had no right to talk to me like that. But he's anxious and concerned. The story is your past and present, Charlie, but it's Dave's future. He's got a right to be excited. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But he goes too far. Maybe, maybe not. How do you know? Would you call Bert? Tell him I'll be late. I did. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to look around and see. People change. Stores change. You're like the three monkeys on the toy. Deaf, dumb, blind. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to look around and see. Stop. Look. Listen. Don't tell me what to do. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to look around and see. All right. I'll look around. I'll see. So, look around. Sure. A department store is departmentalized. If it wasn't departmentalized, it wouldn't be called a department store. Look at that. Another new department every six months. Well, why not? They've got lots of money. Sure. You can see things. It's light, clean. The space they've got. No wonder it looks so organized. But that's the trouble. It's a different kind of store. It's big, cold. It hasn't got the personal touch of, uh, well, my drugstore. Hmm. My drugstore. OK, maybe in comparison, the store could stand a little cleaning up. But that's a detail. 
Anyway, my customers feel more at home in my drugstore than they do here, because it hasn't changed. I'll bet even Bill would agree with that. No, Charlie, I don't agree with you. It's what the customers want. You've got to keep changing with their buying habits. Otherwise, they'll go someplace else. That's why we moved our expensive silver upstairs and brought the sportswear down to the street floor. But, Bill, it must cost a lot of money to keep changing. The money isn't wasted. It's an investment, part of a plan. Charlie, people are, well, as, as customers. They're not deaf, dumb, and blind. Huh? What'd you say? People are affected by what they see, by what they hear. Yes, but your business is different. As a department store, our problem isn't any too different than any other store. We're all serving people. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. What's the matter, Charlie? You okay? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sure. Well, thanks a lot, Bill. I, I've got to go. I've got to look around. So, these were the first ones to departmentalize with packaged goods. Look at that. Dime stores even displaying large sizes now. Putting them out where people can get at them. Simply by displaying them, they're selling them. Oh, another one of those. Well, gotta admit, it's a bright, shiny new store. Yes, people and long rows of cold, impersonal merchandise. Pick things off a shelf, throw them into a basket. <laughs> but who needs personality to sell a can of beans, five pounds of potatoes? Or toothpaste, or shaving cream, for that matter. So. She couldn't wait yesterday till I went downstairs to bring up some Breck shampoo. She was going to stop back later. Hmm? Look around. Look what happens when you look around. You see your customers with all the service I give them. They still buy my product in another store. People want to be served fast nowadays. Help themselves when they can. You've got to keep changing where they're buying habits. Otherwise, they'll go someplace else. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to look around and see. No, it's no good to look around. You've got to do something. It's not a lousy store, it's a lazy store. All right, I've got to do something. Hello, Walt. Well, Charlie, what are you doing way over here? Haven't you got enough to keep you busy in your own store? Uh, uh, look, Walt, uh, do you have a few minutes? Well, sure, why not? What's the matter? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm confused. Dave says I'm behind the times. He keeps after me to, uh, well, reorganize my store, but I don't know. Uh, oh, it's not that the store isn't doing well. Oh, it? I know, I know. You remember what this store looked like a year ago? Sure. Like mine. Uh-huh. Worse. I thought I was doing pretty well, too. But I didn't realize what was happening. I ignored the salesmen, the drug journals, all the articles telling me to reorganize. I know, I know. So I looked around, and I decided not to let competition beat me over the head. You know, I'm getting too old for that. Charlie, you know, people have a regular time to visit the supermarket. They didn't have a regular time to visit my place. I began to feel maybe my store wasn't inviting them. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take a chance. After all, I took a chance when I first started in business. Sure. So I went to the bank. The banks have been giving me the business for years. I decided <laughs> to give them some. <laughs> oh, I didn't do too much, and I didn't do it all at once. I couldn't afford to. So I tried to utilize what I had. Look, I opened up my shelves. I took out the wall section and opened up my prescription department. Over here, I repaneled with lighter wood. On these counters, I had the wood scraped, cleaned up, shellacked. Here, I took off those awful old counters, you remember them, and put in some self-service units. That's all I did physically to the store. Mostly, I just reorganized, cleaned up, departmentalized. Of course, that part only cost me time and effort. The physical changes cost me $2,984, payable in two years. 
No cents? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there were 95 cents, but they knocked those off. And now I'm knocking off the dollars, because in six months, my volume's risen about 15% and is still rising. Now I'm selling people who've been living in this neighborhood for five years, people I never saw before. You saw that customer over there waiting on herself? Well, now that never could have happened in my old store, where the customers had to ask for practically everything they wanted. <laughs> what am I saying, my old store? <laughs> I keep forgetting I'm still in the same place. You know, it's amazing what a new atmosphere will do for you, and for the customers, and the salespeople, too. Yes. So this is how you get people to stop. This is how you encourage more traffic. Sure. Plus a consistent mailing program of my own. That really makes them stop. And when I get them in here, the store itself makes them look and shop. By golly, Walt, you're right. Sure, it's open, it's organized. They know where to find things. But you know all this, Charlie. What better way is there to sell nationally known brands? People don't have to be sold these items, they buy on impulse. If you put them out where they can get them. Most of them shop with their eyes. So you've got to make your store a kind of, well... A, uh, a visual want book, huh, Walt? That makes customers look and shop. Sure, that's right. Remind them of their needs. That's why it's a good idea to departmentalize. You can go even farther. You can find hot spots. Spots in the store that people look at coming and going. They look at the special section every time they come in. Begin to expect to see the things they need. Yes. If you plan, if you make a plan, you can pull people into your store with direct mail, special promotion. With a good window, you can make them stop. If your store is well organized, neat and clean inside, you can make them look at your merchandise, encourage shopping. Sure. Well, what are you getting so excited about? Huh? Oh, uh, well, thanks, Walt. Well, don't run away. Stick around a while. No, I want to go over and see Al Wallace for a few minutes. Oh, I go way over there. That's practically in the next county. Well, thanks anyway. I tell him hello. in the neighborhood. Who do you mean? Charlie Higgins? Yeah, it's Charlie, all right. But he looks like he's been taking his own sleeping pills. <laughs> Will you finish this? Here you are, Mr. Rowland. Oh, by the way, do you believe in insurance? Well, sure, who doesn't? I guess everybody does. We have fire insurance, health insurance, accident insurance, but we never hope to use it, do we? That's right. We hope not. Well, here's some insurance right here. We never hope to use it, but we should have it around. I see what you mean. Here, just look. It has everything you need for an emergency. Mm-hmm. It's a good idea at that. Maybe you could use one at home. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Oh, uh, hello, Al. How are you, Charlie? Say, uh, self-selection really works, doesn't it? Makes it easy for people to look around and shop. What's the matter, Charlie? You've seen the store before. No, I'm just beginning to see it. And say, uh, where did you find such a good salesperson? Didn't find her, I trained her. Trained her, huh? Sure, wholesalers, manufacturers. Johnson & Johnson has training programs. All available to you, all you have to do is ask. Yes, a Johnson & Johnson salesman left a training course with me. You think my clerks would use it? I think so. But one sales course isn't going to answer your problem, Charlie. You have to reorganize your store to accommodate your selling. Look, why don't you have a cup of coffee? I'll be with you in a minute. Oh, thanks. Uh, coffee, please, and some kind of a sandwich. Say, how do you like that? I haven't eaten all day. Oh, my goodness. How would you like a ham and cheese on rye? Oh, that'd be fine. All right. Look, Charlie, 
this layout of a new store and an old store is what started me thinking. Let's ignore the counters. In this old store, the only merchandise available for complete self-selection is here. In the new store, we have almost two-thirds of the floor area to accommodate many more shoppers and expose more impulse merchandise. Here, when three customers come in, only one is waited on. Two must wait their turn. The salesperson spends his time away from the customer to collect what she knows she wants, rather than helping her select additional items. In this old style store, we're paying a salesman for his shoe leather instead of his sales ability. In the new store, that customer has already selected perhaps uh, two out of three items herself. But most important, these two other customers are not waiting and damning us for being old fashioned. They're helping themselves. I know you agree, Charlie. No matter how well trained our salespeople are, that training can't pay off if they've no chance to use it because they're chasing merchandise instead of selling customers. Look, Charlie, I got this little flannel board and I laid out my old store. Then I began moving things around. What were my problems? What would my customers like? How much simpler it would be, for instance, for Joan to get from here to here for baby items if I took out these counters and put in an open display. Yes. You know, I have counters like these. If I took them out, like this, uh, put an open display here, I could expose all the quick turnover items. Well, sure, then we wouldn't have to chase around after every single item for every single customer. Sure, it gives you more time to sell. Gives you more time to supervise. And it makes your salespeople feel happier, more a part of the store in a new, improved atmosphere. Uh, it makes you feel 10 years younger, believe me, Charlie. That's it. Now listen. The what? Stop, look, listen. Just as the book says. We have three jobs to do. First, we have to make the customer want to stop at our stores. Second, we have to encourage shopping. Make it easy for people to see our merchandise. Third, we have to train our salespeople so that the customer will listen. The better the salesperson, the more the customer listens. The more he's inclined to buy, right. You know, all these things, reorganizing, departmentalizing, displaying, training your salespeople, and they all add up. They all kind of fit together, don't they? Like a glove, Charlie. Like a suppository in a mold. <laughs> but. How'd you do it, Al? Where'd you start? Well, I sat down with this board, Charlie, and I made a plan. It was important and necessary for me to do something. Now, Charlie, these people knocked themselves out for me, doing research, getting information. Why should I ignore it? 39% of all drugstore customers prefer to shop in self-service stores. 15% of customers can't find what they want. 30% feel they must be careful about where prescriptions are filled. Is the store neat, clean, uncluttered? People won't buy in just any drugstore. They say the prescription department is the main factor in their choice. So does Dave. Yeah, but when these people found out that over 25% of our customers thought that grocery stores were more progressive than drugstores, I decided I better do something for my own good, for my salespeople's good, for my customers' good. Sure, but how? Well, I wasn't in the dark with my eyes closed. Yes, I get all these things, but I never seem to find time enough to do anything about them. Take the time, Charlie. Oh, I know, Al, but the cost to do as much as you did here. Well, you don't have to go at it whole hog. Size up your situation. If you decide the time isn't right to do the whole job, do it where you're weak. But whatever you do, make it part of a master plan so that everything's related. And do your master plan first. But it still costs money, Al. Well, it's an investment, Charlie. It amortizes itself. Look, for what I've done here, all this, I figured it would take me between four and five years to pay it back. Oh, at least. Yeah. But in 
One year, Charlie. One year, mind you. My business is up over 25%. And that means it's only going to take me a little more than two years to pay it back. I'm happy, Charlie. I'm amazed at the changes the change has made. Yes. You've got a nice store, Al. It's modern, it's clean. People feel good shopping here. And that makes me happy, Charlie, because I like people. And I'm also making more money than I did before, and that makes me happy, too, because uh, I also have a small fondness for money. <laughs> oh, this is a very special letter. I've got to apologize to a very smart soldier I know. Oh, uh, can I borrow this thing, Al? Sure. Take it. <laughs> Take the book with you, too. Oh, oh. <laughs> My hat. <laughs> well, Dave, you're right. It doesn't hurt to look around. I guess I would have almost agreed with you last night, but you kept pushing me. And the more you push a tired, set old mule like me, the more I resist. But, well, uh, the old man isn't quite as dopey as you think. You forced me to open my eyes. Today, I looked around. I saw stores. I saw people. People I want to pull into our store. Sure, all right. I used to be deaf, dumb, and blind. Now I realize you have to make people stop, look, and listen. <laughs> deaf, dumb, and blind. <laughs> Yep. My son and I, together, in a couple of years, we'll set this town on fire. Yes, sir. We'll have the hottest store in town. to work part-time? Why, yes, I'll send someone down to see you. Someone who'll do the caliber of work you expect. Goodbye. Work. There's a word that's used much more than it's understood. As counselor here at our school, I get to hear and see a great deal about work and what it means. Good work, fair work, poor work. I'd like to tell you about a certain student who was here about five years ago. His experience has important meaning for you. When Frank Taylor started in his first real job, he had only a vague idea about work, his responsibility to his employers, and to himself. But suppose we let Frank tell his own story. It all started with a sign in the window of Canfield's shoe store. Sounded good, a chance to earn money for some of the things I wanted. So I talked to Mr. Canfield. We got along all right and, well, I got the job. It wasn't bad for a week or so, 
But then I began to get bored. It was just put shoes away, day after day. Put shoes away, put more shoes away. Nothing ever broke the routine. All I did was put shoes away. And then the pay I got, huh? That wouldn't buy many of those things I wanted. The shoe business was no good. And just because I got to work a half hour late now and then, I didn't understand why Mr. Canfield should get mad. When I had a customer, it was tiny shoes on big feet. These didn't look right. These didn't fit right. These were too expensive. These hurt her feet. Boy, some of those people really made me sick. I didn't last very long, but then it was only a job. I figured I could get another job through the school guidance counselor. Well, Frank, I've looked over your school graves. I've checked the results of your personality and aptitude tests. I've spoken to some of your teachers. I think I have a job you should be able to fill. That's great, Mr. Barlow. The job I have in mind is at Mr. Canfield's shoe store. What is it, Frank? Well, I... I don't think Mr. Canfield would hire me. Why not? Because he just fired me. Haven't you got a different job, maybe, somewhere? Just a minute, Frank. If Mr. Canfield fired you, you might have the same sort of trouble somewhere else. Would you like to tell me about the job and what happened? Well, nothing happened. The, the job was just dull and routine. The same things every day. Uh, I was just bored with it. You know, Frank, I don't think there is such a thing as a dull job. But suppose you tell me what you think is interesting work. Oh, I think it would be exciting to be an architect or an airplane pilot. Yes, those can be interesting jobs. Or they can be dull and routine too, depending on your mental attitude. Why do you suppose an architect finds interest in his work? Because he does something important designs houses and buildings and bridges and, and lots of things. Yes, an architect does help to make things that people need. And he can look with pride on the completed structure. And the pilot provides transportation that people need. He can be proud of his skill and his record of safe flying. But what about, oh, a teacher? Can't she be proud of her service to the community? Are druggists important? Where would you be without them? Or without fishermen? Or chemists? Or bank clerks? Or shoe salesmen? Don't they do something useful, something important for people? Look, Mr. Barlow, I didn't take that job to do anything important. I just wanted a little spending money. Any job, piloting a plane or selling shoes, is as important as you make it. If you think it's not important, whatever it is, you'll soon become bored with it and do it poorly. To enjoy your work, you'll need to find enough more than money. You'll need personal satisfaction, pride of accomplishment, a sense of importance to others. Whether it's a part-time job after school or a lifetime career. And as for money, well, we all want money. But if you don't perform any service, or if you don't do your work well, you can't expect much in return, can you? Why, guess not. If your work is to profit you, it must also profit your employer and profit society. But how can you do a job well if it isn't interesting? It wouldn't be much of a job if you couldn't find something interesting about it. Here, these are records of former students I helped get started in jobs. Most of them used to think very much as you do about jobs, but I'd like you to know what they think of their work now. Russell's my name. I'm a carpenter. That's work I really enjoy. Have you ever felt the smoothness of a board after you've planed it? Have you ever smelled fresh cut wood? Have you ever made something with your own hands? You can't help enjoying work in which you can take a real pride.
I'm Ed Kane, farmer. I suppose I started farming in the first place because I like the open air and, and the soil. But there's more to it than that. The hard work of plowing, planting, cultivating, all leads to the harvest that means success to me and food for people throughout the world. So to me, there's real satisfaction in farm. Dottie Grant is my name. I'm a secretary. To some people, that means just numbers and letters, taking dictation and typing. Well, it's more than that to me. The work that passes through my hands means work for men in factories, keeps railroaders busy shipping our goods, and gives salesmen something to sell. My job is important to many people, and to me. I'm glad to say that I enjoy doing it as well as I can. Enjoy doing it as well as you can. You see, Frank, there are many ways of looking at a job, any job, with pride and pleasure. All right, now let's see what other job we can find for you. Or, Mr. Barlow, do you think Mr. Canfield would take me back if you asked him to? Well, after Mr. Barlow talked Mr. Canfield into giving me another trial, I found new interest in that job. It was easy to get to work on time, and, and when I really applied myself to my work, there was nothing dull or routine about it. It wasn't long before I began to see how much other people depended on fellows like me to give them properly fit shoes. Shoes that would wear well and look well. I became proud of the fact that I was building a circle of personal customers. People who came to me regularly for all their shoes. So in him, Mr. Canfield was willing to give me more responsibility and more pay. It was no longer just a job. Because I had found interest in my work, Naturally, I did better work. I became more valuable to Mr. Canfield and to his customers and, of course, to myself. Well, that's the story. Almost. That was five years ago. The reason I told you about Frank Taylor is that he called me just now. He needs a part-time helper. You see, he's manager of Canfield Shoe Store now. Does this begin to sound like fiction? It does happen. It happened to Frank because he found interest in his work and satisfaction in doing it to the best of his ability. Every day, someone, somewhere, learns that more money and more satisfaction are the result when you stop thinking about just the job and begin thinking about work. Looks all right. Tell me, why are you interested in this job? I need a steady job, Mr. Wiley, with a chance to go places. I see. Now, this one job you had with the uh, Central Distributing Company, you worked there for 18 months? Yes, sir. Why did you leave? Because I wasn't getting anywhere. After 18 months, I figured I was worth more than they were paying me. 
And I figured I was ready for promotion to more important work. I see. Honest, Mr. Wiley, it was a rotten company. I don't know why I stayed as long as I did. Tell me, were you fired? Yes, I was. But it wasn't my fault. The company just up and started firing people. Retrenching, they called it. What do you think of that? I think it's a pretty normal situation. A business has to live within its income. Many factors affect that income. Sales, general economic conditions, the development of new industries that replace old ones. For these and many other reasons, businesses often go through periods of adjustment and reorganization when they're forced to let people go. I didn't do anything. Why me? You said that in 18 months you hadn't gotten anywhere. That's right. Other fellows who started later were promoted right over my head. How much warning do you need? Couldn't you see the company valued the other fellow's services above yours? But I thought I was doing fine. What did I do? Do you expect me to answer that? No, sir. I guess you wouldn't know. Actually, I probably do know better than you do. I have no business taking time for this, but well, I can't help thinking you might really amount to something if you'd set your mind to it. Trying to see yourself as your employer saw you. Better still, let me give you a picture of a case I really do know. It's about a young man who came to work in our shipping room here, and another young man. Now, we begin work here at 8.30. That's the time to begin this business of keeping a job. And that's the time Bob Anderson began work every day. We could depend on him to be on time and to do his work on time. You might call him an eager beaver, but look at it from the employer's point of view. Wouldn't you like to have Bob working for you? Dependability is one of the main keys to keeping a job and getting ahead. Now, dependability includes a willingness to work. Some of the work in our shipping room is hard work. That's why we've always had two fellows working there. Well, two fellows who were supposed to be working. The other fellow I want to tell you about is Walter, Bob's brother, Bob's twin brother. But the resemblance is only skin deep. Look at Walter from the employer's point of view, and you see how not to keep a job. Look at him from Bob's point of view, and you see how not to get along with your fellow workers. On the other hand, Bob would be popular wherever he worked. You know he would do his share of the work and help others who needed help. Cooperation is another way to keep a job. Walter finally decides to go to work, but a job he was supposed to do first thing. Actually, he was supposed to run them off the evening before, but he put it off. This is how not to be dependable, how not to cooperate with the company and with your fellow workers in your own and other departments. Poor Walter. Who should come into the shipping room but me? The boss always seems to find out. Walter's manner gave him away. Now, it isn't hard to learn to make good, clean copies on a duplicating machine. And this wasn't the first time I'd had to criticize Walter for making poor copies. And it wasn't the first time he tried to alibi his way out of the situation. The fact was, Walter just couldn't take criticism. Yet, how can a man expect to improve on a job if he won't listen to the very people who can help him? Just before closing time, you'll find Bob getting the shipping room ready for the night. And you'll find Walter getting himself ready. So he won't be a second late punching the clock. An employer sees this as a sure sign that a man isn't really interested in his work. 
I ask you, if you were the employer and had to cut down your staff, which fellow would you keep? That's not hard to answer. But why didn't you go ahead and fire this, uh, Walter? Now, don't be too hasty. I'm only telling you about Walter's bad points. He did enough work to hang on to his job. As long as times are good, there'll be jobs for fellows who just barely do enough to get by. But to keep a job when the going gets rough, you need to insure your job. Make yourself so valuable your employer can't let you go. We've talked about dependability and cooperation. Now, another prime quality is initiative. And for once, I have something good to say for Walter. It's not hard to understand why he was unhappy whenever shipments were left just inside the door. The packages had to be hauled all the way across the room for wrapping, then hauled back again when they went out. If you don't like the way things are done, you can spend a lot of time complaining about it. That was Walter's usual way. But this time, he got an idea. And he knew what to do with it. In every company, there's plenty of room for improvement. And the management usually welcomes suggestions from employees. Walter's idea was a practical one, so we adopted it. The company benefits through time saved and less handling of packages. The fellows in the shipping room benefit through having one of their jobs made easier. And Walter improved his standing with his employer by his display of initiative. But one good mark isn't enough. One day, not long after, Walter was taking advantage of a lull in the work, and Bob was bringing the shipping records up to date when... What you got there? Shipment for you. <laughs> Wise guy. Well, finally. The stuff they've been running in here asking about every hour for the last three days. Sign here. That's the way it is in this company. They wait till they've run out of something, and everybody runs around like crazy. No system. And nobody in charge with enough brains to start one. What a way to run a business. You don't like the company. Why do you work for it? Me, I work for a swell outfit. I'm proud of them. Maybe I'd like to work for them. Could they use me? What for? A press agent? Yes, Walter found out that nobody thinks very much of a man who talks against the company he works for. And what did Walter gain by making that false statement about his company? Nothing, except trouble for himself if it got back to his employer, which it did. I guess it's not very different from the way I was talking to you about the place where I used to work. Well, there's a saying, if the shoe fits. Oh, the shoe fits all right. You knew it would, didn't you? Yeah, I could see my shortcomings all over the place. Dependability, initiative, cooperation, and loyalty. I could have done a lot better on every count. You can do better. Come on. Yes, sir. Well, Bob, I've got a new assistant for you. Bob Addison, this is Ed Blakesley. Hi, Ed. Glad to meet you. Bob's a good man to watch. As soon as he trains somebody to take over here, he's moving up to assistant purchasing manager. Say, that's great. Mr. Wiley's been telling me about you and your brother. My brother? Yeah, your twin brother, Walter. I uh, had a point to make, so I invented a twin brother for you. You see, in this twin of Bob's, I was really describing Bob's poor conduct on the job when he first came to work here. Oh, you mean the way I was loafing on the job around here before? I get it. And then you... Well, if you can... Say, Mr. Wiley, did I ever tell you about my twin brother? Once upon a time, long ago, a man encountered three stonemasons. 
He approached the first and asked him what he was doing. The mason looked up at him gruffly and replied, I'm placing one block of stone on top of another. The man approached the second mason and asked him the same question. I'm earning 50 centimes a day, replied the workman. Still curious, the man asked the third mason what he was doing. The mason turned to him and smiled. I'm building a cathedral to the greater glory of Notre Dame. Stop, man. So long, Charlie. You were great, Dan. We really did that job in nothing flat. Oh, we sure did. That's what I call teamwork. <laughs> man. See you, fellas. So long, fellas. Just... Man, I'll just about make it to work. Now that I'm out of the shipping department, I like to get there early. See you later. Hustle it up. So long. Morning, Dan. How goes it? Morning. Fine, thanks. Never better. Hey, what's that? Oh, my fireman's badge. We had a garage go up this morning. I used to belong to the volunteer department in my neighborhood, too. I had to give it up when we moved. You know, I sure had a lot of fun with those boys. We got a great bunch of guys, too. Besides, I figured that now I own a house. I better make sure it doesn't burn down before it's paid for. <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> what do you know, Tom, a fireman too. Nice guy. And he's got his eye on him. Hope he's noticing all the extra work you've been doing. <laughs> morning, Dan. Good morning. Dan. Morning. Are you finished with those worksheets yet? Here they are, Mary. All processed for you. What did you say? I finished them for you. They're all done. But you're supposed to prepare these for me to reference and extend. Well, I was just trying to speed things up. I thought you'd be pleased. Pleased? When you do my job? What am I supposed to do all day? Sit on my thumb? And look at this. Why, you've made some terrible mistakes. It'll take me hours to get this straightened out. I wish you'd do your job before you start dipping into mine. I'm sorry. What's wrong with her? You were just trying to learn more about the department. What a place. Anything wrong? No. Now, come on, Mary. What is it? You don't look very happy. Well, it's Dan. Not holding up his end of the work? Oh, no. He's, he's trying to do too much. It's confusing. Joe was never like that. With Dan, I never know what's happening. Hmm. Well, maybe he's just trying to share the workload. I wish he'd share somebody else's. Why doesn't he wait until he's asked to help? Well, now, if it bothers you that much, I'll speak to him. Oh, no. I guess it'll straighten itself out. Okay. Let me know how it goes. 
Oh, by the way, I have to be out of my office for a few moments. Would you be kind enough to listen for my phone? Happy to. Thank you. Looking for something? Do you have the price quotations? Sure. You will let me know if everything's all right, okay? I just want to check them out against some invoices. I wonder what's bugging him. What do you know? Mrs. Dickinson from the accountant's office. Wouldn't hurt any to let her know who you are. Well, hi, Caroline. Tell me, are you here on official visit, or were you drawn by my fatal charm? <laughs> Your charm, of course. <laughs> but seriously, Al, since time's out, what can you tell me about those increases in estimates? Uh, anything I can do for you, Dan? Good oh, morning. If there are any problems, I'd be happy to help. <laughs> well, uh, Mrs. Dickinson, this is Dan Wright. Hello. Hello. Mrs. Dickinson is Bert Williams' secretary. He's the company accountant. And Dan, Mrs. Dickinson and I have worked together for a long time. I think I can manage to give her any information she might want, okay? Nice meeting you, Dan. And thanks for offering. You're welcome. My, he's an eager young man. Yes, well, he's uh, sort of into everything. He's only been here a little while, but I have a feeling he plans to be president of the company by the time he's 30. You better watch out. These days, you can't be sure. No, I think he's just a little green yet. He hasn't found out where he fits in. But uh, what about your problem, Mrs. Dickinson? Will you keep your eye on those requests for price quotations for us, Al? Bert's afraid we're slipping so far behind, our estimates will be way off. Sure. Sure, I'll do that for you, Caroline. Thanks. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Al -bye. sure cut you off. Well, just wait till he wants something. Mary, I have to review last week's inventory statement. I was wondering if you had it. No, I haven't seen it. I know where I'd look, though. Ask Dan. No, I, I think I'll check with Al first. Thank you, Mary. Al, do you have last week's inventory statement? Yeah, sure, Tom. Purchasing department. Oh, no, sir, this is Dan Wright, one of his assistants. Oh, yes, sir, we'll be caught up on the invoices by tomorrow with everything current after that. You're welcome, sir. Goodbye. Sit down, Dan. Yes, sir. Who was that? Mr. Goodhue in production. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Did I hear you tell him that we'd be caught up on the invoices by tomorrow? Well, yes, sir. Are you aware there isn't a remote possibility of being caught up on invoices for several days? Sir, I didn't want us to look bad. Maybe you better close the door, Dan. Now, I wasn't going to bring this up until our periodic review, Dan, but uh, because of the situation, I think we better have our talk now. Now, look, Dan, you're bright, you're eager, you're the kind of young man the company needs. That's why I took you over the others from the shipping department. But you're trying too hard. Well, I try hard to be helpful. Yes, I know you do. But there is such a thing as knowing how to help. And besides, don't you think you should be concentrating on your own job rather than tackling something you're not fully familiar with? Well, sure, sir, but I already know my job, don't I? Yes and no. Oh, yes, you know how to process invoices, but you don't know how to get along with the people you work with. And it's also your job to fit into the workflow of the department. And that can mean learning the boundaries of a job, too. When I came up here, you said I should learn all phases of the department so I would have an understanding of what's going on. You will, Dan, but it takes time. You can't learn it all at once. Well, don't you want me to take more responsibility? Sure, 
It helps get the job done. It shows initiative. But initiative should be backed up with judgment. Judgment and sensitivity. Awareness of the needs of the department and the feelings of others. Now, it takes time to learn the rope stand. Jumping the gun can hurt instead of help. Now, look what you just did. By jumping the gun with good hue, you put the whole department on a spot, and I've got to go and clear it up. Now, look. Stick to your job, son. Hmm? The invoices. Yes, that's your job. All right, sir. If that's my job, that's exactly what I'll do. Good. And I think when you learn to work within the boundaries of your job, you'll enjoy it much more. Apply some initiative in that direction, hmm? Yes, sir. I see what you're driving at. Okay. If he wants just an invoice clerk, that's exactly what you'll give him. That and nothing more. As for them, let them stick to their work and you stick to yours. Sorry to interrupt, but I thought if you weren't too busy, you would help me check on some requisitions. You better talk to the boss. That's not my job. But you've already processed everything. Well, I'm checking them through again for accuracy. I don't see where that's necessary. Thanks for nothing. What's the matter, Dan? Bite you again? Yes. It's as though he doesn't even know we're in the same office anymore. Funny, before he tried to do everything himself, now he won't even lend a hand. Oh, I think the kid's only trying to find himself. Listen, I'm just about caught up. Maybe I could give you a hand. Oh, gee, Al, thanks. You're a doll. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. Trouble, I'll bet. Wonder what it is this time. Don't worry. We'll be the first to know. Yeah. Forgive me, Tom, if I get to the point. Well, by all means, go ahead. Well, first, I think you're already aware of the fact that you're behind in processing and it's affecting the operation. Well, then, what's the trouble? Something has to be done. I know there's a problem, and I'm working on it. You what? Well, I, I don't see how this could have happened. The material was checked and double-checked. Oh, you phoned me. No, I didn't get the message. Listen, Mike, I'm sorry. I'll see that it doesn't happen again. Right. Did Mike Morris call and give you some changes on price quotations? He started to, but I thought he'd better give them to you. I put a note on your desk. Oh, my. You should have told me right away. You know, it's important that we get those changes immediately. What's the matter with you? Look, Al, now I put a note on your desk. What do you want me to do, handle your job for you? Finally getting to you, huh? You better believe it. And this time, it's going to cost money. The kid's only trying to find himself, to quote you. I wanted to make you aware of something that may or may not be important. Caroline phoned here the other day for some information we needed right away. Your new man answered. Dan? The one that was transferred recently from the shipping department? Mm-hmm. Anyhow, Caroline wouldn't have mentioned it probably, but I happened to be there when she called. Seems he wasn't very cooperative. Oh, he gave her the dope she needed, but he let her know that it wasn't really his job. Well, thanks. I think I know what's bothering him. I'll straighten it out. Good. Dan, would you come in a moment, please? Sit down. Now, look, Dan, I didn't mean to lean into you so hard the other day. And I can't blame you completely for reacting the way you did. 
But I didn't make myself clear when I told you you were jumping the gun. I'll admit I was angry. And your reaction was to, to withdraw and pull back. Now, maybe that was natural, but it's just as bad as overextending yourself. In either case, you were thinking of yourself, not the department. Now, here, maybe this chart will help. It shows how one person's work relates to the other. Now, you've seen this. Now, each of us has an assignment. Our section has an assignment, and the department has an assignment. Now, there may be times when you don't think your job is so important. These charts don't really give us an accurate picture of what's going on. They show the individual jobs, but they don't show how one job fits in with another. They don't show the lines of communication between the men. Jobs don't fit into nice, neat boxes. They look more like this. Let's say each of these circles is a man. And the whole pyramid is the department. Notice, instead of being separate, the jobs overlap one another. That's more the real picture. First of all, every man has to know his job thoroughly. That comes from training and experience. But equally important, each of us has to know how his job fits in with the rest of the crew. He actually adjusts his work to the others. And that happens right here. I call this area the cooperation zone. This is where the other fellow can help out or take over if you're snowed. And you'll do the same if and when the situation demands. In other words, although there are definite boundaries to your job, those boundaries will be stretched when you take over the duties of your buddy. You mean that though my job covers a particular area, it can change? Right. In fact, it's always changing within certain limits because the situation is never the same. Your overlap may even become total. Let's say if Charlie here is overcome by smoke, then you take over his entire job. The boundaries change all right, not only day by day, but from minute to minute, and you change with it. But doesn't that make us all sound like interchangeable parts, Chief? No, you're an electrician. The first thing you do at a fire without even being told is see that all the power is off. Ernie here is a roofer by trade. He chops holes in the roof when it's necessary. He knows right where to go. That way, each one of us brings his special abilities to the job. You affect the job, and the job affects you. Now, I'm beginning to see how important coordination with the other guys is. But how do I know where I fit in? If you don't know, ask. Ask me, ask the others. Remember I said communication comes first. Teamwork depends on communication. If the first floor of a burning building is about to give, you may have to drop what you're doing and let the guys in the basement know they better cut out. A fire is unpredictable. I think I've got it. You mean that what my job is, what constitutes my job, is determined first by the situation, which is always changing, and secondly by what I know, which is also changing, for the better we hope. <laughs> and that's why we all have to be aware of the overlap zone and keep in constant communication with the other guys. Right. Any more questions? Okay, I guess that does it for tonight. Meeting adjourned. Are you with me? Oh, yes, sir. I was just thinking about what you were saying. Now, doesn't it sort of go like this? Instead of boxes connected by lines, an organization chart should really be a series of circles that overlap like this, where people cooperate. I see. Say, that's very good. Oh, well, it's not really my idea. Our fire chief explained the force that way to me. Now, why didn't I think of that? All right, let's talk about firefighting. Now, this circle is the engineer. This circle is the ladderman. And this circle here is the hose man. Now, let's suppose that they're actually fighting a fire. Each has his job to do. But suppose one man starts to lose control. Somebody whose job overlaps his is alert and prepared to help. Other men help too. They fill in the gaps. Nobody even thinks about credit or blame. They just want to get the job done. 
Now, suppose a man saw his job as an isolated function, having no overlap, just barely connecting with, with these other circles. Now, this is his job. This is all that he's going to do. everyone realizes that a job is a dynamic, changing responsibility, something that doesn't belong to a man forever unchanged, but a role he fills, then he becomes a part of a team, a part that meshes with other parts, working toward a common goal. Does that make it clear? Well, sure, when it comes to fighting fires, but as far as I can see around here, it's exactly the opposite. I tried to do more than the invoices, and you set me back. Look, Dan. If a man sees his job as bigger than it is, he moves over into someone else's area and causes hard feelings. And the others resent him. Well, that's why I pulled back. How did that work? Not too good, I'm afraid. And upset. Now, let's see what happened when you saw your job as smaller than it is. Now, areas that should have been overlapped were open. You let all of us down, including yourself. And you lost out on expanding your knowledge of the work, on improving yourself, by not having the feeling that you were doing all that you were capable of. Sir, now you know I didn't mean that to happen either way. I know that, Dan. Well, then if you could uh, just show me my zone of cooperation. Well, I'm afraid I just couldn't show you. Now, this is a give and take thing between all of us. Now, everybody should be in on this. Mary, Al, would you come in for a moment, please? You know, Dan came in with a very good idea that was expounded by his fire chief. Oh, Dan. Yeah? Would you mind checking these requisitions against your invoices? I've got more than I can handle right now. Well, gee, Mary, I'd like to, but I can't. Well, thanks, anyway. <laughs> Always trying to get you to do her work. You give people an inch and they take a mile. Wait a minute. Have you forgotten so fast? I call this area the cooperation zone. This is where the other guy can help out or take over if you're snowed. And this is where you'll do the same if and when the situation demands. You lost out? Didn't do all you could. Let us down. You know I didn't want that to happen either way. I can give you a hand now, Mary. I went through the stack, and it's not as heavy as I thought. Don't trouble. No, honestly, I can help. I want to. Sure? I'm sure. Besides, I could use some variety from the old routine. Oh, well, good. I'll show you how, and then you'll know if you ever have to do it yourself. Well, you take the, uh, the amount of the estimate. Hope they're okay. Wasn't as hard as I thought. Thanks, Dan. Here's the way we've been able to handle the price quotation. Hi. By listing... Hi. By listing them under diversified titles, like claims department here, and then we have personnel records. Thought you might need this. Oh, what is it? It's the inventory statement from last week. Oh, yes, thank you, Mary. Am I supposed to enter the total of this? Yes, right here. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, Al, do you need this? Oh, no, Dan, that's all right. You can keep it. I, I just wondered where it was. Right. Uh, no, sir, he's not here. I'm sorry, sir, I don't know, but I'll take a message. Just a moment, sir. For you, sir. Thank you. Hello.
lunch? Oh, I can't. I just got the word from Tom. They've got a 30-day delivery date. All requisitions due by the end of the day. Well, you might make it with some help. I'll be right back with a couple of sandwiches. Hey, thanks, Mary. Listen, get me a ham and cheese on rye. Okay. Uh, double on the ham and cheese, Mary, with mustard. Al, I can work through lunch with you and the rest of the afternoon if it's all right with Tom. Great, Dan. Now I know I can make that deadline. <laughs> hey, Mary, get a piece of apple pie for my friend on me. <laughs> now, here's what we'll have to do. If you can hand me out of state. Once upon a time, not long ago, a man encountered three volunteer firemen working on their truck. He approached the first and asked him what he did for a living. The man looked up and replied, I work down the corner garage for three dollars an hour. He approached the second man and asked him the same question. I work on an assembly line, putting one bolt after another. Still curious, the man asked the third fireman what his regular job was. What do I do? I help make sure our company has the materials it needs to make the products that we sell all over the world. <laughs>